Good morning. You're tuned to KBOO Portland. Coming right up, it's Veterans Voice. Hosts Angie, Andy, Angie and Marvin interview Jeremy Lucier, Lucier and Mark The way we put the end to war. Welcome to Veterans yeah. Voice Radio Show on KBOO 90.7 FM here in Portland, 91.9 FM Hood River and the Gorge, and 104.3 FM Albany, Corvallis, Eugene, or streaming on the World Wide Web at KBOO.FM. Or you can hear some of our older shows that we've done by going to KBOO.FM slash Veterans Voice, one word. I'm Marvin and with Angie today. Good morning, Cascadia. <laughs> and our guests today are, are Michael Wal- Walgrave and Jeremy Lucer. And uh, I just want to say hi to my wife. She's up in OHSU. Uh, pretty sick, but uh, I, she's going to be okay. And we're going to be talking to the guys here in just a minute. And I want to do one more thing here before we get going. And uh, just want to say hi to, to, to Laurel and get well soon, honey. And I'm going to hand it over to Angie to get this started. So, Marvin, what do you think about the JTTF? <laughs> yeah. Like we were talking, and, and I never heard anything about it on the news at all. Nothing. I Or after either. So, it's just sorry. It's sorry. Well, I, I noticed that there was basically a media blackout on that i was doing all kinds of searches and everything and i could barely find anything on that interesting very because they don't want us to know about it that's for one thing so but we're today we're going to be talking to these guys and it's really interesting and i like we had uh, what was his name on that about the gardens last time that was really yeah dust on man that was really good and so these guys will be talking a lot about stuff like that. So, so uh, we have uh, we have uh, Jeremy and we have Mike here today. Jeremy is an Air Force veteran, uh, and Mike is an Army veteran. And so I'd like to just maybe start with uh, I suppose I'll start with you, Jeremy. Um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, how you got interested in joining the military in the first place i yeah. see that you joined in 1990 actually wow so uh how did you come about joining the air force um well good morning and uh thanks for having me on here um marvin god bless to your wife and um mm. yeah it's a pleasure to be here um how we got into the air force uh you know i turned uh 18 in march uh, 9th of 1990 and really wasn't going anywhere in life um so basically my parents said you're 18 now it's time for you to leave the nest (laughs) and i was just like what you know i had no clue of you know how to pay rent how to pay bills um so you know there was a couple reasons why i joined that was one of the reasons um you know i was going to get paid i was going to learn a trade but also you know i come from a long line of you know family that has served Uh, my father was uh in the air force as well I had an uncle in the Air Force. Um, you know, my grandfather served in World War II. Mm. Uh, so for me, it was, you know, something very traditional that I really needed to do. And you were in for 14 years. I did. I served about 14 years. Um, you know, my experience was a little bit different. Um, I started in the Air National Guard. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I picked avionics. Um, I qualified. It was very difficult. But I really excelled at it. Um, so I did learn a trade. Um, you know, I went to a lot of advanced schools. Even though I was in before Desert Storm, I didn't have to deploy. I was still in school. Um, and then a lot of things that I did were, you know, a lot of humanitarian missions. Wow. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that's also a big portion of of what the military does as well and that's that's something that makes me really proud Mm -hmm. while while i served yeah so what exactly was your job avionics i don't do you know what that i I don't uh avionics craftsman 105th air wing stewart 
Yep, uh, 105th Air Wing, Stewart Air National Guard Base, which is uh, down in Newburgh, New York. Uh, my uncle was stationed there as well. Wow. So that really encouraged me to, to join there, and we served together. Um, basically, yeah, I worked on the, the C-5 is the largest in the fleet. Yeah. Right. Um, and avionics is basically just aviation electronics. Oh, electronics. So gotcha. I was responsible for uh, your GPS systems, uh, navigation systems, mm-hmm. uh, autopilot, you know, any any of your hardcore electronics we actually worked on. So we worked all over the aircraft, you know, where it had been hydraulics, air pressure, engines. Wow. Um, so I learned a lot, and I was able to take that to, you know, outside work as well. Mm-hmm. So did when you got out of, this, out of the Air Force, did you go to work doing the same thing? No, uh, I got a medical discharge because I had uh, I was diagnosed with uh, C- COPD, which is chronic obstruction pulmonary disease. Oh wow! Um, so my doctor said, "Hey, you know, mm-hmm. you really can't do this type of work. You know, obviously, you know, JP8 fuel and and you know, sucking in all those fumes yeah. is not going to be, you know, productive for." Um, so what I did do was, as soon as I got out, you know, I had a game plan. It was like, you know, I wanted to go to school. You know, how can I supplement what I had already learned? Mm-hmm. And I decided on electrical engineering. Ah, cool. So you weren't actually planning on getting out of the military. You were probably planning on retiring. Is that right? I did. Um, you know, spending 14 years and <laughs> so. having my uncle that spent 34 years in the Air Force and wow. retired. So for me, that was, you know, I was a lifer. And um, I was devastated at, at the time. Yeah, you know? I can imagine. Um, getting out in 2004, um, you know, a couple of years after 9-11, it was... Right, that's you know, right Right when we were starting to get into everything, actually. When we were starting to sink into the war in Iraq and and everything like that was to about 2004. Yeah. Right, right. You know, my whole base deployed and, you know, you know, there's this, you know, one of the biggest things I really miss is the camaraderie. And it doesn't matter if you serve the Army, Navy, Coast Mm -hmm. Guard, Air Force, whatever. Um, You know, you all have that camaraderie. Yeah. Oh, you got the Air Force and, you know, they just sit around and do nothing. And, you know, we we (laughs) definitely kind of egg each other on. But, you know, that's part of, (laughs) you know, that community. Sure. Um, But, you know, after being out for so many years, it kind of like... Okay, what's our purpose for being over there? Um, how do you know us as a people in the United States or Afghanistan or Iraqi people? How are they really benefiting from what's going on over there? And um, you know, it's a shame of you know the things that are actually happening over there. Yeah. yeah. So you're you're actually you ended up getting out uh, in 2004, and then where did you go after that? Um, basically, uh, just literally the day I, uh, left, I went home, I packed my car and I just spent a month on the road, just wow. traveling around the United States, oh, yeah, good for national you. parks, visiting friends and family. And, and that's, that's something I noticed about you as well, Mike, is that you did a little bit of drifting around after you got out. So, uh, when did you join the military and from where, and how did that come about? Um, actually, I was drifting around before the military. <laughs> I uh, had a philosophy. You just continued it when you got out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I became a professional drifter when I joined the, the Army in 2006. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got out in 2009 and uh, decided to continue traveling the U.S. One of the reasons I had traveled earlier on was uh, I kind of felt like I needed to utilize my freedom in america that people had fought for so uh not having borders in this country and an open road really appealed to me and so i hit the trail after college the first round and went about my business for four to six years and then decided to join the military after that i guess may had a little born on the fourth of july syndrome i was born on veterans day so (laughs) and so every every birthday i never got a birthday card and unfortunately because well post office is closed on veterans day but but that i think that hit home a little bit more than i mean it resonated with me uh what was going on a little bit at an earlier age and And so you also had family in the military too i did uh and still do Great grandpa served in World War One. Uh, grandpa served in World War Two. 
uh, dad served in Vietnam, and then I joined up in OEF. So, Did you think that you were going to be deployed? Uh, I was pretty sure on that. I mean, it was 2006, and I, I guess I, I, I kind of felt like if I was going to be part of the military industrial complex, I might as well be on the front lines. In the and thick of it. In the thick of it, you know, they have a shot at me just as much as I have at them, I, mm -hmm. you know, and so. So, uh, well, what what did you do exactly? Uh, I was in the infantry. I was a eleven Charlie, a mortarman. Mortarman. Yep. And mm -hmm. not quite like Vietnam, where you had to go through tunnels, hashing people out in your spare time. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, we basically got out in Afghanistan. Was there for fifteen months and. Um, I like to think we were peacekeepers while we were there. Mm -hmm. uh, we were building schools, handing out supplies, trying to figure out all these tribal warfares that were going on, village to village even. And I guess we were hunting for Osama bin Laden. Uh, at least that was yeah, one thing. Yeah, you never really know what you, you do. Never know. <laughs> I learned that too. <laughs> he just, uh, this really interests me. Filmed African Highway in Pak. Paktika? Paktika. Paktika province, Afghanistan, to pass the time. Yeah. What is that about? <laughs> uh, well, <It's... laughs> I decided to turn the camera on while I was there, so I filmed the whole deployment just from, like, uh, what we do in our spare time when we're not out, you know, rounding people up and what have you. So, uh, yeah, it was more for my buddies, and it's turned out to be a pretty good project. Uh, I called it Afghan Highway because there was yeah. no actual roads where we're at, and so it was just this, <laughs> you know, not not really there, but we were there, and so I took a video and got 15 months, and wow, yeah, you know, ended up sharing it over the internet. Yeah, I was going to ask you. It's on. So what do you, to find it on you on uh, YouTube? Yep. Where do you go? Uh, what do you put in? Well, get, is my, Afghan you, Highway. Afghan Highway is wow. the, the name of the series. Uh, Peripheral Drifter is the name of the YouTube site. I also have a website, drifterradio.com. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah, it more or less developed from sharing with my buddies while we were over there because we had Internet access at various points. So I'd send them stuff that we were doing at our base, and they'd send me pictures from where they were at, at their base. And now, as it's turned out, uh, it's kind of kept their group together a little bit. Mm -hmm. so. hmm, that's pretty interesting. That's really interesting. So you were over there for how long? Fifteen months. Fifteen months in a grunt unit. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend it. Well, I don't. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't recommend that at all. So how how would you describe Afghanistan? Yeah, really. Oh, uh, where we were at, uh, it's not all of Afghanistan's like that. But where we were at, it was just a desert mountain wasteland. So mm -hmm. you do eight hours of guard duty a day, just staring at dried up river beds. You know they've. <laughs> They've definitely had some climate issues. They we we took over an old British fort that was been there for I don't know decades, and uh, basically there used to be a farm there, but now there is nothing, and I think that's kind of played into some of the the craziness they've accepted over there. So. Yeah. Hmm. Well, what's and another thing I like here is drifted for peace, 14, 14 week. Shack boat Mississippi River drift from Wisconsin <laughs> to New Orleans. Okay, come on. <laughs> what is that? All right, that was taking drifting to another level. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I followed this guy in his web blog back in 2004, 2003, and uh, told him when he got to La Crosse, Wisconsin, that he'd have a place to stay and, you know, basically open the doors for him. And when he got there, he uh, had been off on a different life tangent, got married, and so mm. he had this shack boat that he needed to get rid of. And so I parked it in a yacht yard for about four years. And when I got out of the military in 2009, about two months later, we painted up a big peace sign, put it up <sighs> on the side of the, this raft, and uh, me and a couple of buddies went down the river. So. Oh, that's amazing, man. That's cool. That is cool. Wow. So you, you were mentioning to me something about the uh the the afghanistan people at first thought you were the russians yeah probably the furthest that we'll ever be able to get off the map was someplace and well, it was winter stand is what they called it in 2008 and we flew in there in black hawk helicopters got out and uh next day we started talking with the, the tribal leaders and they were 
they thought we were the Russians. <laughs> they couldn't believe America was this far on the other side of the country and their little neck of the woods. That is amazing. So, so uh, why did you get out? Um, you, you know, it, it's the military, you know, and yeah. I, I felt like I had served my time, but I had better things to do, such as, for example, float the river and drift for peace, you know, and yeah. and. Uh, <laughs> That's great. That is great. Were you a platoon leader? I wasn't. I wasn't. You had a college degree, and you weren't a platoon leader. I went in as an E4 and basically just wanted to see what yeah. it was like at the very bottom rings of the rung of the, the military. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, yeah, I understand that. Okay, now let's talk about, Jeremy, let's talk about what you do now. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually just got a part-time job working at a uh, really small bakery. It's called Farmhouse Bakery in Cottage Mm -hmm. Grove. Mm -hmm. Um, It's family-owned by uh, Bob and Pat Daniels. Um, I enjoy working there. It's great. Um, I'm learning a a lot of stuff. Um, But the other portion is, uh, you know, Mike and I live together down there uh, for a couple months trying to get together, um, you know, both Drifter Radio, doing video media, I'm also a photographer, so I'm working on a food blog, uh, but also um, we created uh, the Veterans Victory Gardens. Yeah, that's – go ahead. So do you want to explain that, what you were doing uh, with that? Sure. Um, So I've been farming for probably since 2007. Um, You know, I met a couple that they were basically farming. They started with, like, you know, your vegetables. They had some fruit trees. Um, then they graduated to raising chickens. And you actually taught me how to uh, humanely harvest, as they call it, a chicken and a rabbit. Yep, we've uh, you know, we started uh, harvesting rabbits, and I think the great thing that happened there was, um, you know, we got it, the system down to where, you know, you had a broody chicken that would hatch the eggs on their own opposed to actually buying pullets or having them in an incubator and stuff um rabbits you know how rabbits are so they they breed pretty quick um but yeah we hosted a class we had a a lot of veterans come out and um you know one of the things it's you know you're, you're taking a life um i'm a buddhist so you know for me i would do a lot of meditation before i would, I would actually do that mm-hmm. um you know you would do it at night or early in the morning where it was dark you know where they're still kind of sleepy um hang them upside down and, and let them rest but mm-hmm. you would sit there and you would you know just coax them and just you know basically talk to the animal and say you know thank you for providing us sustenance and um you know just to make sure it was really calm Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, as we gained more experience, we learned better ways to actually slaughter that animal. I like to say harvest because some people yeah. kind of get a little detracted from that, that word. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it was amazing. Huh. Wow. And so what, how, why, do you, why do you gravitate towards farming so much, do you think? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, one thing I want to bring up is uh, this book called Field Exercises by Stephanie Westland. And basically it just talks about how veterans, when they're transitioning from that, that military environment to a civilian one, you know, it, there's a lot of discord and it's, it's, it can be very difficult. So, you know, veterans are getting involved in a farming where you have a tangible goal. Uh, you can see the results, whether it be, you know, you're growing beans, you know, week by week or even three days along the way. You're, you're seeing that plant grow. It flowers. You see that fruit growing. Uh, there's a lot of satisfaction there. Um, so when you get to see, you know, how you go from, you know, putting a bean into the ground to where you're picking those beans, basically farm to plate, you're cooking your meal. Right. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing experience, and it's very... Um, you know, especially with people that have PTSD, which I was diagnosed with, it, it really helps. Uh, you know, you, you know, a lot of times it's just like it's not the nine to five job where, you know, you're basically just a drone and, you know, you're paying taxes. And, you know, this is something that you can actually readily enjoy. You can teach other people. Um, and if you talk to a lot of other vets, it's it's really beneficial 
you know, another one is you can do photography, equestrian, you know, mm-hmm. whitewater kayaking. It's like, you know, whatever it takes you out of your element and, you know, rather than you're stuck in your head, it's, it's kind of, you have something else to think about and, you know, other goals that you can achieve. Right. And I think wow. that just being in nature in general is one of those things that's really therapeutic for vets is for me one one of the things i did when i got out is i spent a lot of time out in the woods i would just drive out and park and hike into the woods and just stay out there for a few days uh and uh separate myself and i think that one of the one of the main things is that the plants and the animals don't judge you and you don't feel under pressure like you do when uh you're going to through the grind and everything like that so um i think a lot of vets can identify with that Mm -hmm. so what do you know of any resources or anything for uh for veterans if they want to get involved in farming or sustainability or any types of uh suggestions you can give to people if they're interested in and uh, getting involved with that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the bigger ones I'd like to bring up is uh, Farmer Veteran Coalition. What um, was it? What was Farmer it? Veteran Coalition. And basically that organization just helps veteran farmers set up farms. Sometimes they all have a grant that you can you can get to help set up your farm. Um, one of the things that uh, I got to participate in was uh, it was all paid for. Um, retreat up at Vashon Island, which if you haven't been up there, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, you know, they pay for our food. We had a place to stay. Um, you know, we sat around in a circle, you know, all different kind of veterans. Uh, um, you know, one couple brought their whole family up. So there's, you know, mm. children there as, as well. You know, because when you really look at it, you know, just because, you know, you know, a husband or a wife serve, you know, the family serves, you know. When the veteran right. suffers, the whole family suffers. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was an amazing experience. It was a difficult time. Um, you know, I was worried about, you know, I didn't have a job. And am I going to be able to pay my rent? Am I going to be able to eat? You know, am I going to end up on the streets? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like this. Really, it's a teeter-totter. You know, what you can yeah, go either fine way. Line. Yeah, really fine line. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also uh, the Returning Veteran Project. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, that's a really great resource for uh, people. They're, Absolutely. Yeah, and they're wonderful. Homegrown by Heroes, too, is, I believe, if you have, like, a a certain product that you want to sell under the Homegrown by Heroes name, if you have two veterans that contribute crops to that specific uh, product that you want to sell, then you can put the Homegrown by Heroes label on it. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting that you wow. did almost a, a complete 180 from from you. You were in aviation electronics, and you were pretty much not planning to get out by any means. And then all of a sudden, here you are at KBU Radio talking <laughs> about how you are doing sustainable farming. That's As really, a really different. It's veteran. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So who who got sorry, Angie, who got you uh, in, interested in? How'd you how'd you get involved in that? Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, when I visited Oregon for the first time, it was uh, okay. Where are you from? I forgot. I'm originally from New York. I grew yeah. up in the capital, and then I uh, was stationed mm-hmm. about sixty miles north okay. of, of the actual city. Yeah. Um, is uh you know i i met this gentleman from um just kayaking hmm. you know that was one of my biggest passions i would actually go to canada twice a year i'd go up there and train and, and do freestyle kayaking like surfing things like that it's kind of like skateboarding on water basically um <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and we were two totally opposite people you know here i was i just got out i was still pretty gung-ho um you know, and it definitely took a while for that transition to, to really happen. But, you know, our relationship just kind of grew from there. Mm-hmm. And we just got more involved in each other's lives. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it just happened. And it, I think it was, you know, a word I like to use is symbiotic. And yeah, I really. think that's something that we've lost is we don't have this symbiotic relationship with nature that that, that we should have. And, you know, when you think about you know, uh, Victory Gardens back in World War II, mm. you know, every house, you know, have 
two chickens and grow your own crops and you know it was more sustainable back there and Mm -hmm. you know now it's like you know you're shipping your food in on these big trucks or on a rail car or and i think we really need to get back you know in terms of like food security and securing your community is having a smaller base where, okay, well, if I'm growing potatoes or raising chickens and you have tomatoes or some other crop that, you know, you can either barter or do a direct trade, you know, where it's, you have this internal monetary system that you're not relying on the actual dollar. Uh Um, And, you know, you can end homelessness, you can end, um, you know, people living in poverty, not being able to eat, Right. Um, you know, because we're basically a fast food nation. Oh, exactly. And we need to get back to, you know, what we really need to be. Right. Yeah. So do you down in uh, Cottage Grove, do you, do you trade a lot of your products to other people? Well, I actually live in an apartment now, so oh. I've only been there for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a few farms out there that are looking for internships or, you know, you have a work trade, rent trade type of a deal. So... Um, that's something I definitely want to look into is more of, you know, homestead living where, oh, yeah. you know, you're working as a community, you know, I'm a photographer, so I can take pictures of the crops and, you oh, know, yeah. put that out there while if somebody knows how to sew, you know, we can trade off those skills and, you know, build this, you know, more of kind of like a spider web network of relationships where, you know, you're all kind of like, it's held together. Mm-hmm. And it seems really hard to get out of, too. It seems really hard to break free from any kind of what we would consider as normal routine life. Once you want to actually start digging in the dirt and raising the animals and doing things like that, if you live in the city, it can be kind of tough, especially when you have to work so much harder than, uh, like, for example, my parents live out in Eastern Oregon, out by John Day. And I could live out there for three hundred dollars a month in a house, or I could live here for a thousand dollar apartment, and then I work ten times harder trying to pay for that than I would out there. So it's it's really you have to work so much harder just to break free from that kind of thing out here. Yeah, right. I mean, what are you getting for your for your dollar? I mean, you're Nothing. spending a thousand on an apartment for Nothing. for what? And it's a place to lay your head. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, now Michael. Let's get to you about how you get, got involved in uh, farmers. Well, it kind of stems from the doing the guard duty and looking at nothingness for 15 months, you know. <laughs> it's kind of where I see our world going towards and so kind of a personal responsibility. I see local agriculture as a a big solution to what we're facing right now and so after I went down the river, I, you know, drifting for peace, I was trying to figure out what the next piece of the puzzle would be to get there. And mm-hmm. agriculture came up. So my grandpas were farmers. And so I decided to go back to school at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, and got my agribusiness degree. And yeah, now I'm just trying to lay my roots down and get involved. And I, and I met Jeremy through the Boots to Roots program, which I highly recommend any veterans returning that if you if you're having issues and problems it's best to get involved with other veterans because they might be able to if jeremy's helped me verbalize a lot of things i've been thinking and going through and uh, as, as well as other veterans that i've worked with and from there I've, I've gone back to school for the university online system for sustainable management and now i'm just trying to get involved with uh local agriculture yeah so, that's great Wait, so go ahead oh um so what what exactly when you say uh studying agriculture what what are you trying to what do you think you would like to uh focus on well i i'm i'm interested kind of in the the hemp coming down the chute here <laughs> yeah it's a couple of years out but uh once uh <laughs> recreational marijuana yeah. has its time and place we'll probably move into the the hemp industry and I see that as a great base for these transition towns that are popping up. Mm-hmm. We're trying to transition to a more sustainable, locally focused community. And the hemp plant to me is a big solution. I've done various papers on that in school and uh, you can make 5,000 products out of that thing, at least, you know, including the basic necessities of living, such as food, mm-hmm. clothing, rope, paper, 
you know, hempcrete, building supplies. And, but, uh, so that, that, that's something I'm looking at, but I, I definitely like the idea of community building instead of so everybody just trying to capitalize for their own gain and their own independent mean and kind of like the idea of the interdependence. So that's going to definitely be key to moving past war, I believe. So. Mm. Well, talk about, you know, I want to know about Boots to Roots. I've never heard of that one. Uh, it was a program, what was it, 2012, summer 2012. It was, it's in the book that Jeremy was talking about, mm-hmm. too. Uh, Steve Cran uh, came over from Australia and taught a two-week permaculture class. Wow. And that was the one that Destan was part of. Oh, Marvin. yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, as well as Penny, Penny they were, too. They were, they were right. all and and now Ian. Yeah. Everybody was involved in that. Were you? I wasn't there at the time. I don't know what I was doing. I think I was working every day, working my life away. <laughs> yeah. To pay for the vegetables uh, with money that mm-hmm. I could have got from you guys for yeah. free. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how that works exactly. Yeah, it didn't work out well. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got, do you live? You lived on a farm. I haven't grown up on a farm. Oh. I moved out here in 2012, so actually that's how I started meeting people out here in Portland was through the Boots to Roots program. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my Army buddies invited me to move out to Portland, and since this has been considered one of the most sustainable cities in America, it made yeah. sense. And uh, yeah, got involved, and I was starting to build, I guess. Wow, that's interesting. Well, what what do you what do you think was one of the most uh, important things that you learned about the boots to roots? Uh, you can do it. I mean, it's not outside the average person's capabilities to build something like that. You just have to stay vigilant with it, and uh, but just the community, I think, and and the healing process. Like I said, after work, we'd sit around and talk about our experiences and. Some people had had more problems than others, but you're able to hash it out. And I don't know, that sense of community was definitely medicinal. In that why, sense. why do you think that some veterans are more likely to reach out to other veterans and some aren't? Uh, it's hard to say. Do you think that I, some people kind of barricade themselves away? I think they don't really want to deal with anybody or anything. The, the the system feels broken, and they might not be able to articulate that. And once you're out of the military, you just kind of want to be away from the military. You know, there's trust factors. You know, Marvin, do you know what that feels like? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that's really interesting that you talk about that. When you were in, was there any any Jeremy? Was there any dissension? In the Air Force, where you were about the wars and the war? I mean, we definitely had our own controversies. Um, you know, pretty much you, you keep your opinion tight lipped. Uh, you know, when they were looking for people to actually volunteer to uh, deploy, nobody wanted to volunteer. Oh, really? Um, you know, so I mean, just like any other community, you had mixed feelings. Another huge controversy was the anthrax uh, vaccination, oh, yeah. where people didn't want to get it. Um, you know, they're going to quit, or you know, um, you know, go AWOL, or however you want to put it. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, uh, you know, being where I was at, the majority of you know my deployments are humanitarian. Mm-hmm. So you know, that took on a completely different element than actually deploying and um, to a war zone right and the fact of being stationed in new york during 9 11 um wow that took on a completely different what meaning. was that like yeah yeah um that's, a, that's interesting i probably cried for two weeks really um do you know anybody that passed i did we lost uh two members of our unit oh. they um they were in their uh primary jobs one was uh an emt the other one was a uh, new york police officer and uh you know, Andrew Don and Jerome, uh, Mark Patrick Dominguez mm. um, went in to uh, save people. So for me, uh, they're heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, they died. And um, and it has a profound effect on me. And even though I didn't feel it at first, it you know, it definitely took a couple of years before, you know, I really started feeling the effects of anxiety and PTSD. And, mm-hmm. and it wasn't like, boom, it's 
it's there. It was, it just slowly creeped into my life and, Mm -hmm. you know, slowly it was like, okay, loud noises or, Mm -hmm. you know, fireworks or things like that, that, you know, you know, really affect me. You know, I jump and get the jitters, uh, having a hard time sleeping, you know, not being able to go to parades or concerts or, um, you know, movies, you know, being around large crowds of people, Mm -hmm. you know, would make you feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, you're checking everybody out, you sit in a, you know, specific place, you know, so you can watch the door. Um, Mm. but it's, you know, it's a two way street, you know, when, you know, I, I recognize some of my triggers, you know, like caffeine, I don't drink caffeine. It's very rare. Um, cause that just makes it worse. Mm -hmm, Uh, you know, I, I try not to put myself in those situations, but at the same time, you know, you've got to test those borders. You have to put yourself, you know, um, outside that box just mm-hmm. because, you know, you know, like you're saying, it's, you know, you get the veterans that, and, I, and I've been there where you're shelled up in your house, you don't go out anywhere, you don't talk to people, um, you know, some people play video games like Call of Duty, mm-hmm. so they're still putting that that same memory from being in the war right basically regurgitating it over and over yeah and you know i i tend not to you know i don't play those type of games you know i just i do a lot of meditation um maybe that's why you got so involved with farming and and working with uh nature and plants and things like that is because of it's relaxing it's uh it's a really big deal to me like i said i'm a buddhist so you know I really look towards nature for inspiration and, mm-hmm. you know, you can just be out there and, and, and just be, you know, you listen to the water, you know, bubbling in the, in the creek or, you know, you hear the birds chirping or um, squirrels or, you know, just the fresh air and, you know, the fresh earth is, it is very healing. And, you know, I'm just glad I get the, I'm able to enjoy it. Um, You know, typically if I go hiking with people, it's, you know, I have my camera and I really take my time and really take it in. And, um, you know, I usually don't talk just because I I really want to take it all in. And, you know, if you're patient, you know, I I think, Hmm. you know, if you're patient and you really appreciate it, nature rewards you. Uh You know, I've seen some amazing things where it's like, you know, some people might look at it as a coincidence or, oh, that's great. You know, but for me, it's like, okay, what can I learn from this? Mm-hmm. And um, and that's why I love it and really put myself out there. Yeah, your Buddhism helps you with that a lot. Absolutely. Buddhism is kind of saved me too, you know, just mm-hmm. the things that it taught us to how to survive. So it's 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 a good thing. More people should check out Buddhism. Absolutely, I'm or Hinduism you. or Taoism. Yeah. You know all those things. Take a yeah. take the pieces that work for you and and, and grow from that. Exactly, because uh-huh. there's all kinds of different things from each one of those that you can take to yourself, and very helpful, very helpful. Right. I got a question for Mike. Yeah, Mike. Ah, on. I got a question for you. <laughs> Mike, you're on the hot seat. Yeah, right, go for it. Um, I'm I'm curious about your experience with uh, Team Rubicon down there uh, with the hurricane relief. I haven't really asked you about that at all. So, what, whoa. Wait. So let's yeah, yeah explain what what Team Rubicon is. Okay, uh, Team Rubicon was started by a Marine, so it's it's an exclusively veterans uh, disaster mediation uh, organization nonprofit. Uh, I believe David Petraeus is on the board at this point. Uh, I, I went to Superstorm Sandy. I, after we got done with Boots to Roots, I was just volunteering around Portland, and my buddy recommended I fill out a form and sign up for Team Rubicon. And so I did, and within 24 hours, I ended up in New Jersey. So, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and we were cleaning up after Superstorm Sandy, and that, that was pretty cool. I, and we found that veterans have definitely a we get it we have a get her done attitude right. exactly we're gonna figure it out we're not gonna get stalled by little things we're gonna just you dig bur- right your in boot, your boots get a little muddy or something you just keep on going yeah it might not be the most beautiful process but mm-hmm. you're gonna get it done and <laughs> so i found that was a great organization so if you're a veteran looking to volunteer i definitely check that out and how do you find out about it do you google it oh yeah just put in team rubicon uh, their website is teamrubiconusa.org 
So do they actually fly you out, or how do you get to the site? They, yeah, we, we took a crew from Portland and drove up to Washington and oh. flew out there. So. Oh, so you drove. Yeah. Oh, okay. They have it divided. They've divided the country into 10 different segments, I believe. And oh. So they, So do you do they pay for your food or anything like that? Yep, they took care of the the food and the housing and and the flight. So mm-hmm. they there was no paycheck. There are paid positions with there. I believe they are hiring right now. So that might be something people want to look into. Uh but uh yeah, they we we were shacked up with the Red Cross Association group that was out there and hmm. we found that there was there were a little bit older organizations so they were more doing with the paperwork and Ah. handling the stuff but when it came to like clearing trees and tearing down stuff and pulling out the heavy equipment that's kind of where we came into it (laughs) (laughs) and that was in sandy that was superstorm sandy Sandy. up in new jersey see you know a lot of people don't understand that when people go into these humanitarian like jeremy did that can be traumatic I mean, really traumatic. Terry Brown was a Marine, and uh, he talks about, you know, doing humanitarian stuff in floods and different things like that. And he, you know, dealt with bodies and and all that. Mm. He came out of the first Iraq uh, war. You know, the war in Iraq is just a continual thing. There's no first or, you know, it's all one big war that they started. But Terry had been in the, in uh, 91, I think Terry was. And then after they, that, they took him to, I think, uh, Pakistan or somewhere where there had been an hur- uh, earthquake and, huh. and stuff. And he went right from a killing zone right to a dead zone, wow. you know. And t- he had a hard time. So, you know, when people say humanitarian, it's not passing out candy bars and, and doing things like that. Uh, it's important. I did a humanitarian people. mission in uh, with my ship in uh, South Korea, actually. There was a hurricane there, mm-hmm. and we went there and just bucketed just gallons of mud out of people's houses for several days. I mean, they're, they're, all their houses were just filled with mm-hmm. mud. And I, and I think, like, why aren't we doing more of that? Because that was sure helpful, and the people were sure happy to have us there helping uh clear out their houses of mud and things like that but why do we have to uh pay 8.5 million dollars for a reaper drone if we can just go uh help people in need i don't understand i don't i don't make the connection there especially so. mike michael with uh with uh being in a infantry cuz i was and my whole outlook on people coming back really was different you know i i my whole thinking about how things were done turned really different and and that's i think that's why i i i went towards the helping people you know to get away from what we did and it was more peaceful and more and more settling for me yeah then you know what i'm yeah. saying yeah, after you're mixed up in the chaos, it's yeah. kind of nice to be able to, you know, put the gun down and just yeah. help sort through other people's messes, I suppose, and just try to give in a different way. And what yeah. was it? What was your experience like with the Afghan people? Yeah, how did you d- deal with the with the Afghans? Um, they were. It, it was difficult, like I mentioned earlier. There was intertribals going on warfare, basically. So. It, Mostly they seemed to be happy that we were there. We were definitely trying to build schools, but at the same time, if we weren't protecting the schools, we had to guard one particular place just because they burned the school down right after we built it. And so, I don't know. They also, they appreciated the food that we were bringing in, the clothing and such, but at the same time, they weren't quite trusting of us probably. Like, yeah. I wonder people. why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here's our guns if you don't like what we're doing. Yeah. You know, here's Do you think other. that we added to their intertribal warfare at all? Perhaps. Perhaps. I, so? I can't really comment on that. I would, I would imagine that they tried to play us between the other villages at certain points. And, you know, there's definitely hashing out a lot of different lies in their own style of, uh, you know, I don't know, psyops, I guess. Yeah, but. yeah. 
Was there a lot of kids in your in your in your area? There were there were a lot of kids, uh, mostly you know, and multiple wives and multiple kids. And mm-hmm. since you know the death rate is higher there because for children, it was just part of the whole culture to have more children. Just to um, yeah, because that's with us in Vietnam. You know, we, we, to me, all seeing all those children and and the war being around them and you know things happening to these children was just devastating for me yeah. just devastating and and you had this feeling of i can't help that poor kid you know right you know you want to help these these kids and you can't so there's just that feeling you know yeah feeling and and it, it's just a horrible horrible feeling yeah. that, that you just can't you want to help them but you can't you know so did the guys in your unit were they were there a lot of thinking about i support this war i don't support the war or nobody talked yeah a lot of it they they were just you know a lot of people joined up because they were coming from impoverished situations so you know like uh, one of the things i interviewed people on with afghan highway is why did you join the military at least nine times out of ten it was money money yeah 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 that's i think and and Afghan Highway, tell them how they can see. Because I'm going to go there and I'm going to watch that, man. All right. It's tell kinda, them how to do it It's kind of infantry humor, so maybe you'll like it, Marvin. I don't know if the <laughs> audience might appreciate it, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, Peripheral Drifter, if you search under YouTube, that should bring it up, or DrifterRadio.com. Okay, Drifter Radio. Tell, well, what's that? Drifter Radio. Tell about that. Well, in 2004, after I'd been hitchhiking around the United States and seeing this planet and, or seeing the country and going to foosball tournaments yeah i said foosball but to what <laughs> tournaments foosball foosball tournaments <laughs> that was my american dream i like the game you know I, it doesn't matter that the top player in the world makes five grand you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> high goals, high goals. Uh, uh. No pressure there. <laughs> did you did you know? Remember how much pressure we felt when in in an infantry unit? How much pressure there was on you? Yeah. And then coming out of that, it's just like I did. It's horrible. I, I think I do drink coffee. Jeremy mentioned that it gives mm-hmm. him anxiety, and mm-hmm. I think I almost drink coffee just to supplement my anxiety. You know, if yeah. there's not some sort of pressure situation going on it's almost like i don't know how to just be peaceful sometimes yeah it's it's hard it's really hard do you go to the va i i I did i just started going there and Ah. i recommend that to every veteran out there do it sooner than later because you know i don't know if you guys have been downtown here or not but that was a maze just to get in there you know and i didn't realize i was having to go through security checks and all this craziness and yeah and i thought about it i'm like i have half my wits about me still and if i only had a quarter of them i don't know if i would have been able to make it there right you know so definitely get there earlier and get your paperwork started. yeah you got to so, get that paperwork going in and 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 taking care of that because a lot of a lot of do you go to the va jeremy um i'm actually very fortunate that um you know i was also a military contractor and uh a condition of my employment i had to be in the military mm. so when i was getting discharged from uh, the military had a provision in my contract that said if I was medically discharged that I would be compensated. So I uh, got 60% of my salary for the first year. I get 40% for life. Mm. Um, uh, living in Portland, uh, my insurance, I was they pick up the major of the premium. I pay what I normally would pay, and you know I would go to Kaiser. Um, mm. I had the same doctor for 10 years. We developed a great relationship where it wasn't that – she decided or I decided what the treatment was going to be. We kind of decided and, and came up with a game plan that was, you know, equally mutual. Um, you know, because, you know, you hear a lot of people that go to the VA and it's just like, you know, they just throw the pills at you, you know, here, take the blue one. Okay, well, that didn't work. Take the red one. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, a lot of people, we call them Skittles. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's terrible where, you know, my doctor, okay, you know, let's start on the medication. You know, but, you know, um, wean off of that. You know, there has to be some type of therapy that that coincides with that. And, uh, you know, just to touch on uh, what Marvin said about, you know, serving in uh, humanitarian missions. You know, uh, 
I think it was in 98, um, during Christmas, I had to go to uh, Caracas, Venezuela, and it was one of their worst natural disasters. Uh, upwards of uh, 30,000 people died. That's, wow. And, that's um, tough. You know, that's like you tough. said, just bodies and bodies and yep. bodies and bodies. And yep. You never get over that. No. and, and I Never, think the, ever. I think the sad part is there was no aftercare. It right. wasn't like I came back and, okay, you know, sit down, talk to a therapist. Are you having you know problems or issues it mm -hmm. was basically like, even when i got discharged it was that's it the gates you closed later. You, you, you're done um about face march right <laughs> and you know i served 14 years and yeah and then, you know, that really bothered me yeah i can imagine and that probably affect that probably affected how you could find employment too and how you met how you socialize with people and everything else right um, i mean well i took the first year off See, that's really and, smart. Yeah. You know, I, that's smart. What you guys did was smart. And uh, taking that time off, boy. But I did get a job when I first came to Portland. Um, I was a server at uh, Romano's Macaroni Grill. Oh, that's a I used to go there. It was great. You know, yeah. it kept me busy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I quickly became a manager there. I made really good money. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time, you know, uh, the civilian world, it, you know, kind of didn't have that negative connotation of, of veterans at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure some people did, you know, war mongers, baby yeah. killers, things like that. But um, it, it was actually an asset. You know, when I look at it now and, you know, you have all your military um, experience on your resume, it's different. You know, a lot of people think, oh, he's got the PTSD. Yeah. You know, he rubs up against me. I'm going to catch it. Well, there's or, so much in the media that talks about veterans are ticking time bombs. Veterans are going to uh, go lash postal. out. Yeah, go, <laughs> go postal. postal. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, it, it's a shame because... It's a real shame. You look at, you know, the infrastructure of the United States, it's crumbling. Yes, and it is. We don't have the money to, to fix it, but, you know, a great way to rebuild that to you know back in our world war ii days is get veterans involved they have the skill set yeah. you know just because i was uh, aviation um electronics you know i can take those that skill set and still apply it to to other things you know mm -hmm. we're you know military people are extremely adaptable people that's true and you know i think if people really embrace that and, and give veterans a chance just like everybody else that you'll be very surprised at what they can achieve in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like Mike was saying about uh, the boots to roots, uh, you know, you, you know, I have before and after pictures of, you know, what we did. We transformed a 4,000 square foot garden. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, at first you're like, wow, you know. It I mean, was all blackberries before, wasn't it? A lot of blackberries, you know, four foot tall weeds. And, you know, it, it had been growing for a while. So, it took time, but, you know, just like watching the vegetables grow, when you, when you see this thing come together and we all work together for, for this common goal, and then you see the end result, I mean, it was amazing. And it, it was two weeks. And go ahead. It, it just, it's hard to really put into words unless you really go out there and do it yourself. Yeah. And, and if, it's, it's such a good idea, though, if we could use veteran skills and uh and work ethic in order to go like you were saying go replace the sewers and go oh, yeah. uh rebuild all the buildings and um fix things around this country you know one thing i always wonder about is why don't we have more recycling facilities because we uh, most of the stuff we recycle gets shipped off to another country on a barge ship yeah so uh why don't we build more uh from scratch recycling facilities and make them more common because out where my parents live there isn't hardly anything out yeah. there everything just gets thrown away all the plastic and everything mm -hmm. so well that's the great thing about when you grow your own food you know you're not using plastic or um you know there's 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 a lot less waste compared to Gosh, shopping at the grocery store yeah. Yeah. well we just ran out of time you guys jeremy michael <laughs> Hey, thanks, thanks for having for us. Thanks for coming. Today. Yeah, thank yeah. you. It's a real pleasure, and there's so much more to do. And I'm just glad Angie's here helping me, you know, and <laughs> doing a lot more stuff, you know. Uh, it's great. And we'll be back uh, on March 20th at 9 a.m. 
Uh, this is Veterans Voice Radio Show on KBOO 90.7 FM. And there it is. <laughs>